So yeah, today we have some great lightning talks from the NIMS R user group. Um, most of these focus around open science work in R, um, and we think we have a pretty wide representation of different topics, so I'm really excited. So we just wanted to um, share a little bit about the NIMS R user group, if you haven't heard about it before. We're a community of R users within NOAA Fisheries. We have monthly meetings on topics related to R, uh, we also have a pretty active Google space where folks can ask questions related to R and um, usually get some good responses. Um, and we also share our related events. Um, we also have a calendar of our related events, including our own meetings and meetings that might be of interest to our users. Um, and so our meeting next month will be um, on connecting to REST APIs with R. Uh, and that'll be on February 28th at 3 p.m. Eastern. Uh, so if you're in NOAA Fisheries and you'd like to join, or you would just like to learn more about our group, you can um, navigate to our GitHub page, um, which is also, if you um, scan the QR code, it's also linked there. Uh, we'll also be posting these slides that will have all the links. Um, we'll share that link in the chat uh, during this call. Um, or you can also reach out to me, Catherine Doring, or Emily, Eli, or Josh um, to get more information. So we also wanted to make everyone aware that NASA, as well as some other federal agencies, have declared 2023 as the US Year of Open Science, um, which is really exciting. Um, there's a a Nature Worldview article on this that talks a lot about what NASA is doing um, in the open science realm, which you can read through the QR code or by clicking on this link um, in the slides that we share. And we also, so we also wanted to highlight, since we are a federal agency, the work that's going on in NOAA fisheries. Um, I should have mentioned NOAA is also participating in this U.S. Year of Open Science. Um, so for more information about some of our efforts within NOAA Fisheries, you can navigate to this NIMS OpenSci um, website, which you'll also be taken there if you scan the QR code in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to kick off our lightning talks. Um, so every presenter has three minutes uh, to share one slide with some of their open science work that they've been doing in R. Um, and so with that, I'd like to start us off. Um, so our first speaker is Hem Nalini Morsadia Luna. And go ahead, Hem. Hi, thank you. Um, so I'm a marine ecologist at the nonprofit Long Live the Kings, and I'm a no affiliate with the Integrative Marine Ecology team at the Northwest Center. Uh, so this work came from uh, me asking the question, how can I share data and code from a scientific publication to maximize it being reproducible, permanent, and easily accessible? Um, so I found this package called Vertical that was created for reproducibility of scientific papers. And the idea is that Vertical uses uh, the, the structure of an R package um, that has already been, it's like an R package that everyone uses, uh, but it uses it in an extended form to uh, include code, data, figures, uh, the manuscripts, slides, posters, et cetera. Uh, and the idea is that because R packages have a standardized and well-organized file structure, uh, it makes it very easy to organize your manuscript um, in that way. So it's, it really provides a natural way uh, to make sure that you have everything properly documented. So as you can see in this slide, um, uh, this, these folders are the, the structure of the package. So you can have your raw data uh, just as wherever you import it, and then you use the um, capability of R to make it into an R data object, which then um, allows you to create this metadata and then um, carefully document uh, what every column in your data is. Uh, so it really forces you to, um, to really be really um, mindful of what you're putting into the package and what, what data you're putting in and what it means and how it's going to be used. Uh, so the, um, the code goes in as functions that are, are documented using our oxygen. 
And then the what would be the package vignette is actually an art notebook, which um, uses Markdown to keep track of all the data wrangling in your uh, paper, the analysis and the figures. So for example, here I have um, part of that uh, vignette where I have, oh, here's the, um, the food web, this is the figure that it produces. And then um, as you push to GitHub, I have an automatic GitHub action that creates this website that, that then I use to share uh, the vignette, the supplement, the slide, and the actual manuscript. So every time I push into GitHub, this gets um, uh, updated. So I'm hoping to um, submit this paper in the next month. So uh, I'll be able to share with the reviewers, um, this is my package, this is my data, everything is here. And if I need to make changes, it makes it very easy to, uh, to implement them. Thank you. Thanks so much, Em. All right, so next up we have Andy Beat talking about StockSmart. Hi, yep, my name's Andy Beat. I work in the ecosystems assessment branch in the North uh, East Science Centre. Um, I'm going to introduce you today to StockSmart, the official website, and then the unofficial R data package. So since we only have one slide, you're going to see that there's a video playing continuously. We can go through that in a minute. If you're not aware of what StockSmart is, then you, you really are missing out on a gem. It's a product that's coming out of the Office of Science and Technology. The acronym SMART stands for uh, Status, Management, Assessment and Resource Trends. And the StockSmart website is a central location for um, stock assessment data from all federally managed stocks <clears throat> nationwide. You can find catch, abundance, recruitment, mortality time series, of any federally managed stock. You can also find many reference points and metadata associated with each of these assessments. You can also download data, use it in your preferred application. It really is a great resource. Now, being part of a, a group um, that's interested in ecosystem science, we're often involved in projects that require, da require data from multiple species. For example, we, we work with multi-species modeling efforts, um, we're involved in ecosystem reporting where we produce annual stately ecosystem reports for both Mid Atlantic and New England councils. Um, we have we incorporate um, socio socioeconomic profiles, um, which provide a means to integrate socioeconomic socio information into stock assessment processes. Um, we do a lot of work with regime shift analysis, fish condition. And all of these products require assembling data from multiple species. <clears throat> and all of these products use the Stock Smart R data package under the hood. So since we at this branch all work in R, we wanted a way to interact with this Stock Smart website without having to be bound to a GUI interface. So the R data package was born um, with the help from members of the Stock Smart um, team from ST, whose names are listed on the slide. Um, the StockSmart data package it imports all of the data from the StockSmart website and serves it up to an R user. The package is updated weekly to reflect any changes made on the website. It's all on GitHub. It's all freely available to anybody. The link's on the slide. So how the package actually is updated isn't, I guess, that important for this talk. However, the behind the scenes code is pretty cool. So if you want to reach out to me, we can chat about that afterwards or look at GitHub. So the video that we have um, cycling through pretty much shows you what the StockSmart website is and how you would search for a species, download the data, in this case, George's Bank card stock. It then steps you through the online StockSmart R package documentation, instructions on how to install the package. And then finally, it shows you a little demo in R Studio on how to pull the same data and create some plots. Um, extra functionality is being um, developed to help extract, plot, and tabulate um, some of the data found in the package. And if anyone wants to start using this and wants to request features, they're always welcome. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. All right, next up we have Andrea Haveron presenting the FIMS R package. Hi everyone, um, FIMS or the Fisheries Integrated Modeling System is an R package being developed as a next generation stock assessment framework. This is a collaborative effort among the Office of Science and Technology and NOAA NIMPS Regional Science Centers. 
The model is being written in C++ with an R and RCPP interface and is reliant on Template Model Builder or TMB for statistical inference. There are several modifications that need to be made to an R package to successfully depend on TMB and this slide here covers the basics. I've also provided a link to the TMB's wiki that provides more details on distributing TMB code as an R package. Essentially, FIMS is broken into smaller pieces of C++ code within the inst include folder of the R package. While the FIMS CPP file lives within this SRC folder, and that's what links the FIMS model in inst include to the TMP's statistical inference engine. This structure follows R package best practice for including compiled code. When the R package builds, it looks to the SRC folder for a file to compile, and all the files in inst include become accessible from other, for other packages. The model compiles when the package gets installed using install GitHub. Um, eventually, maybe we might be on CRAN, um, but essentially we are, um, when this package installed, it gets saved to your R home directory uh, within for packages. And in order for TMB to be accessible to the FIMSR package, we add TMB to imports in the, in the description file, as well as TMB and RCPP eigen to the linking to argument of description. In order for this DLL file uh, living in your R home directory for packages, this is again our compiled C++ model in this instance for a Windows machine, uh, we use this used in lib FIMS so that when we call library FIMS, this gets loaded into the R environment. And we uh, essentially, the this gets added to the FIMS namespace, which we are having written automatically by running our, our oxygen to the FIMS package script. I also wanted to highlight a couple of other features of the FIMS R package. We have a dev container set up that allows us to code and develop and run FIMS in a virtual environment through GitHub code spaces. We also use GitHub Actions to set up um, a number of automatic tests documenting and formatting of the code when code is pushed up to GitHub. We've also linked in at the bottom here, we can see a couple of badges uh, that show results from some of our actions. And you can see we have this code coverage badge, which shows that we are um, testing our package while we're developing. We currently have very high code coverage. We're using Google Test to test C++ components of FIMS and test that to test the R scripts, the run, the IO interface. So this package is completely up, uh, open source and up on GitHub, and please visit the FIMS landing page for more information. Thank you. Thanks, Andrea. So next up, we have Alana Santana and Rory Spur talking about visualizing ESA listed fish research in the West Coast region. Hello, everyone. Um, as Catherine has said, my name is Elena Santana, and this is my co-developer, Rory Spur, and we're both second year students at the School of Marine and Environmental Affairs at UW, or the University of Washington. And like we said, today we'll be sharing our project with you on visualizing ESA listed fish research in the West Coast region. Yeah, so the goal of our project was to create an interactive web application through RShiny. And the project was bought, brought to us by the West Coast Protected Resources Division who receive applications from researchers wanting to study endangered or threatened species. But currently, the Protected Resources Division does not have an easy way to visualize this data, hence our goal of creating an application that visualizes and summarizes these data. Um, in pursuit of that goal, we developed two different components to assist in the data visualiza visualization. We have a map component and we have a time series plot component. Starting with the map component, the map shows where research is currently being authorized and is organized by watershed. There are controls to the left of the map that allow users to filter the data to focus on whatever species um, they're, or life stage they're interested in. When users will make a selection, the map will auto zoom and pan to show the boundary of whatever ESU is selected, adding a little more usability and preventing people from getting lost in the zoom controls of the map. Um, there's two my primary goals of this map. The first one is to allow for increased data sharing and collaboration between researchers, which will reduce total impact to species and increase efficiency. And a secondary goal of the map is since it shows where research is happening, it also shows where research is currently not happening. 
uh, which will also help reduce pressure on species while simultaneously suggesting new areas for research. For the time series component, the time series is located in the bottom right corner of this page and it displays the permit authorizations and how they have changed in the last 12 years. With the blue bars reflecting unused take, which is essentially the take that was authorized that researchers did not utilize, and the yellow bars reflecting used take. The height of the bar itself reflects the total take initially authorized. The purpose of these plots are to better inform the protected resource division on how much take to authorize for the purpose of conservation and to not over authorize research for uh, authorized take for research. Um, the time series can also help identify areas in years where uh, take was not authorized but occurred anyways, either accidentally or intentionally, and allows the protected resource division to isolate those projects where these occurred. All of this was made possible by utilizing our shiny and plotly packages to develop interactive plots that allow you to change inputs or display different plots, isolate variables, zoom in and out, compare and contrast statistics, and export plots, making a seamless analysis experience. And if you have any questions, please feel free to contact us. Thank you again for all your time. Thanks, Selena and Rory. Uh, next up, we have Greg Williams. Go ahead, Greg. Hey, thank you. Um, my name is Greg Williams. I am a marine ecologist with the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. Um, I'm on the ecosystem team there and I help coordinate the California Current Ecosystem Status Report. I wanted to review with you a little bit about um, some steps we've taken to increase the repeatability of workflow and automation for our ecosystem status report. Um, and our primary objective um, for this report is really to compile and integrate a lot of data from over 90 scientists in a fairly short time window. And then we synthesize this data into some status and trends reports for the Pacific Fisheries Management Council. Um, and uh, really the second objective and what I want to talk about here is, is uh, our steps in sort of adopting an OpenScapes framework for a community of practice of open data science. Um, because we have a team that's that's pretty broad with the various um, levels of familiarity with R and coding, and there are a lot of different steps involved in this process. Um, we felt as if the OpenScapes framework was really was really helpful, and I wanted to just review some of those steps with you. Uh, first step, uh, which I outlined below, is we developed this pathway, um, which is essentially a conceptual model that really brought our entire team into a conceptual single sort of a framework for understanding how things work. Lynn DeWitt led this, the left column, which is really our data integration. She developed an automated data uploader. So in the past, PIs would, would email data. Um, now they do this remotely. It's all integrated into some Google Sheets and then ultimately stored in ERDAP where it can be served. Um, then Nick really led a lot of the work with the R coding. Um, he generated some standardized figure code where um, which generates these time series plots here in the middle, as you can see, which really form the, the basis for a lot of our, our report. And then all of these um, are integrated along with table, table and text submissions um, that we use GitHub uh, projects for sort of tracking what submissions are, happen when. It's all knitted together using the code into this final report, which is moved into uh, Google Docs and our editors like uh, Chris Harvey and Andrew Lysing and others can can do some live editing, formatting changes. All that information should be, it's actually this report is uh, an internal review, but it's being submitted to the council next week. And most of the data is already up on the web, uh, the CCIEA website. You can also, um, we're developing infographics associated with that with the communications team here. Um, and I think the key takeaway is really um, it's built a community of um, practice and greater trust, and we're moving to a web-based web, uh, web -based, uh, reporting framework. Uh, and I think we're that that should be happening in the next year. Yeah, thanks for your time. Thanks, Greg. All right, next up we have Eli. Go ahead, Eli. Uh, hi, everyone. So I'm Eli Holmes. I am an applied mathematician at the Northwest Fisheries Science Center. And, you know, when we think about open science, um, often think about open data, open source, 
that is a crucially important part of it. And we've seen some really great talks in that aspect of open science. I'm gonna give a little um, vignette on other aspects of open science, which is open collaboration and open workflows. And I talk about this in the context of complex government reports. And the type of reports we're doing, we have data, we have analysis, we have tables, we have figures, and then of course we have text. And it's very easy for these reports to have a very non-reproducible workflow. Um, and one of the efforts within the R community is developing reproducible workflows using something called R Markdown. And this allows us to combine text. And then if you see down in the little like box down here with the gray is our code for creating our tables and our figures. And that creates very clear uh, reproducible workflow exactly how everything is created. Now, when we create reports or when we're working within the sort of our ecosystem of, of these report workflows, we use a design philosophy of separating the content from the, the typesetting. So if you see under the content, we just have like plain text and then the code that creates everything. That's our content. The typesetting is then done that create whatever format we want. And these are different people who are working on the different aspects. And one thing that I've been working on or I worked on was creating a extension in order to create PDFs that have title pages and cover pages. And that might seem really niche, but when we're creating reports, we need we need that branding, right? With the, we need that formatting. That's part of, of what we have to have. But this requires really specialized skills, LaTeX, Pandoc, um, what else, uh, Quarto extensions, Lua filters, kind of unusual things. So I created this extension that then anyone can create these um, reports with all the all the branding and really makes it simple. It's a really fun collaborative process with the um, our user group uh, community. I ended up posting my first version to Twitter and then collaborated with uh, another user in France who helped with the um, Lua filter aspects. So check out the um, NIMSAR users. You can find this template and lots of other templates for NOAA branded stuff. Great, right. thanks Eli. All right, and next up we have M. Markowitz, go ahead. Hi everyone, I'm a research fisheries biologist at the Alaska Fisheries Science Center's Groundfish Assessment Program, and I work in the Eastern Bering Sea um, going on fisheries independent surveys. Um, I'm really excited to share the hard work we have done to share our public data, public facing data with the world. As you can imagine, there are a lot of people out there who are interested in assessing the Alaska's um, bottom trawl data, right? Where are fish? What uh, different environmental systems are they in? Um, how many did we catch? Uh, and, and beyond. So while we have historically shared our data, um, I think it would be polite to say it was a little bit cumbersome to access. These data and these workflows were decided on 15 years ago, relied on some very curious code, um, outdated decisions about what was in the data that we shared for display of that data, very difficult to read and find metadata. Um, I'm sure a lot of that hits home for people who have similar problems um, with the data that's being shared on the internet from their programs. Uh, so needless to say, we thought it was time for a new vision about how we were gonna share our data. Um, working in tandem with our IT staff here at the Alaska Center and in partnership with the awesome FOSS team of the Office of Science and Technology. Um, last summer, we were able to start sharing our data on the Fisheries One Stop Shop data portal. Um, it's been hugely successful. Uh, there, we share our standard station level, foolproof catch environmental haul data, catch per unit data, um, from all the surveys, and we share that to the world. This has been pretty momentous in um, our vision for uh, what our data mean outside of our group. 
And not only does this allow for modernized data accessibility where users can access the data via user-friendly interactive tables or API connections, it also allows us to meet those PAR requirements. Um, then uh, we <laughs> are able to construct transparency for our documentation and descriptive metadata. There's a link to that uh, in our GitHub page for this project. Uh, streamlined data distribution that has been key to this process. We, the scientists, make the data and uh, share that ta those tables with the FOSS team and they manage that uh, public facing platform. We used to have to do that. We did not do a very good job. It's a little bit outside of our wheelhouse. Reproducible workflows and versioning is all available and achievable through uh, GitHub. Um, one of the biggest selling points to my supervisors was that this was going to cut down on time that we spent on data requests for our very simple standard products. And lastly, and most importantly, this is an opportunity to welcome collaboration and invite the community for feedback and manage issues through GitHub to make this product the most useful and powerful product that it can be to the stakeholders and the public. Thanks. Thanks, Em. All right, next up, we have Sean Rohan talking about Cold Pool. Go ahead, Sean. There we go. Uh, thanks. So today, uh, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about the cold pool package um, that developed with uh, uh, colleague Lewis Barnett. Um, oh, should mention Bering Sea Bottom Trial Survey Group, just like Emily, who just who just went. Uh, so temperature is an environmental driver of species distributions and ecosystem processes in the Bering Sea, and as a result, the, these temperature products that we collect during our bottom trial surveys are of, of interest for use in stock assessments. Um, as covariates and stock assessments specifically, and also in uh, Alaska ecosystem status reports that report patterns and trends in temperature. So the Alaska version of what Greg was, was talking about a couple presenters ago. Um, so our old way of uh, sort of preparing and sharing these data products is that we use different methods to calculate temperature and cold pool area uh, cold pool being the area of the Eastern Bering Sea that has bottom temperatures less than two degrees. Um, so the slight differences between methods led to discrepancies in, in the products and also uh, some biases when, when data were missing. Um, cold pool area was calculated manually with, a, with slight methodological differences uh, between years, um, which meant that reproducing results from a single year were relatively problematic. Um, there was Little to no documentation of how everything was calculated uh, and what exactly the, the products were, were describing. Um, and if you wanted to use the products, basically you, you would just ask somebody and hopefully track down the person who, who had the access to the products. Um, so the cold pool package is designed to sort of increase accessibility of the data product, uh, improve reproducibility and also uh, bring transparency to the methods that we use to, to calculate these products. So the product, uh, the package calculates annual bottom trawl survey temperature data from the Bering Sea from our annual surveys, uh, provides data products as built-in data sets with, uh, with documentation, um, and surprise, supplies free to use plots because people like to use uh, plots of bottom temperature and cold pool area for, for presentations. Um, so the way that this works is that we pull direct data directly from the database and shape files from another package within our uh, our GitHub org, which has our ecosystem of public facing code bases. Uh, testing is done in, a, in another package um, that the dependency. Uh, we get the raw data and put that onto the repo, use geostatistical methods to produce the data products, and then we update it once a year uh, with the new data product and users can just update the package and they'll have the new data product, um, which has greatly improved the efficiency at which they sort of can, can get to those products. So thank you. All right, next up we have Elizabeth Gugliotti. Hi everyone, I'm Elizabeth Gugliotti and I sit in the National Stock Assessment Program within SNT where I provide software support for the stock assessment model stock synthesis. And today I'm going to talk to you about some ongoing efforts that Catherine and I are working on to use the Posit Connect API to run stock synthesis. 
um, a problem that was presented to us is that people want to create and deploy Shiny apps that run stock synthesis, which is not currently possible. And so we wanted to test potentially using the Posit Connect to deploy an API that actually is able to run stock synthesis that these Shiny apps could potentially use. Um, for, from the developer side of things, you have to set, set this up locally first. Um, and so we have a GitHub repository that is hyperlinked here. And this repository includes some stock synthesis base files with the executable adjust file, um, a manifest, and the plumber file. And we adjusted the manifest and, and set up the RS Connect credentials through, through just the terminal. Um, a part of this, you have to create an API um, key in Posit Connect and tell it which server you want to deploy it to. Um, and these were these this steps were all run through the command shell. Um, using Jest. Catherine, can you click next? By running those commands in the PowerShell, the API is actually created by Plumber, um, which is in our package, and then it's deployed on Posit Connect, and you can click next. Once you have it deployed, the API looks like this, and you see a couple different commands um, that say git by it. And the first one is just has the backslash ss and or the forward slash um, ss, and that actually runs stock synthesis. And then the next one actually gets the results for you, and those results are specified within the just file. Next. From the user standpoint, you need to go onto Posit Connect and create an API key to be able to interact with it through our, our studio or whatever other um, app you use to be able to interact with code if that's VS Code. Um, so once you do that, you can use um, the Git functions within HTTR if you can click Next. So the code looks like this. You're able to, to run these lines of code. Um, I'm sure people have different ways of doing this, but the first git um, actually runs stock synthesis, and you want to be able to have that, say, have a status of 200, um, which lets you know that it ran. And then if you can click Next, you can view the result um, and use the JSON Lite package to view it a little bit better. And you see that you're actually getting the results from that forecast new file. Um, and so we were able to run stock synthesis and get the result that we wanted to view. Um, and with that, I'm done. Okay. All right, next up we have Meg Oshima and Mark Nunn. Go ahead, Meg, and yeah, just let me know when you want to click through. Um, hi. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Meg Oshima. Uh, I'm with the Stock Assessment Program at Pacific Islands Fishery Science Center. Uh, today, I'm sharing how my colleague Mark Naden and I developed a workflow in R that allowed us to automate the development, running, and evaluation of nine individual stock synthesis models. Um, uh, can you click next, please, Catherine? Um, so while each individual model is fairly simple in itself, there's only one fishery fleet, one short index of catch prenat effort, and one source of link composition data, this was the first assessment cycle where the stock was actually being assessed as individuals instead of a complex. So we had to build all nine models from scratch within the course of one year. Uh, next, please. Um, so to complete this task, we relied heavily on R and several key R packages. We kept all of the sensitive data in a private shared Google Drive folder that we could download onto our local machines via R. Um, we also put all of the key parameter values for the stock synthesis models in a shared Google Sheet, uh, which allowed both of us to access them simultaneously. We can make changes to the values and then update our models in real time. And we used R4SS for manipulating the stock synthesis files and writing them, so we were never editing any, anything by hand. Um, and this cuts down on a lot of human introduced error and it made it easier to track our development as we went. Uh, we also used R4SS to run the models and diagnostic test. Um, and then we used SS3 Diags for producing the diagnostic outputs. 
um, to evaluate the models. Um, and then finally, we use Corto to generate formatted figures and tables for each species that we can directly input into the report since we were basically um, making the same figures and tables for nine times. Um, so all of this allowed us to be able to collaborate easier, reduce human introduced error, uh, increase the transparency of our model development, and allowed us to spend more time focusing on the actual models themselves and the smaller time-consuming tasks like formatting tables for the report or searching through a bunch of lines of code to find one value to change. And now we have a fully reproducible automated workflow to pre-process our data, write the model files, run the models in all diagnostics, and produce outputs for the analysis and report just using two R scripts. Um, and this is good because at PIFS we have several stocks that are currently assessed and managed as one complex, but we hope to transition them into single species models in the future. Um, so this framework can then be applied to those stocks when they reach that point as well. That's it. Thanks, Meg. All right, next up we have Felipe Casada. Go ahead, Felipe. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Felipe. Uh, I'm working for uh, the Southwest Feature Science Center and GC Santa Cruz as a postdoc in economics. And today we're going to talk about this uh, paper I've been working to estimate landings by port. Uh, but the idea of this paper is to estimate this landing depending on which kind of flick segment uh, vessel is into it. Okay, so the first thing I have to do in this project was to cluster the vessels in different groups. And for this, I use this R package cl uh, called cluster. Okay, I use the function PAMP, which uh, is a partition uh, of the meals. Uh, method uh, and I use different characteristics of vessels to, to run this code. Uh, one thing you have to do with this code is that you have to decide the optimal number of cluster that, uh, uh, that and, and then you have to put this one in the in, in the code, right? So here is the R in this left part of the screen, right? You have the R code how you run this. Uh, you have to estimate a distant matrix with all the input of the vessels to try to and scale them. And to normalize them, to try to compare between them. And the figure I have here is the result that I found for my group of vessels. This is for quattro pelagic species, uh, the one that starts sardine and anchovy, right? And here I found eight groups. Uh, and this graph shows you like different like average input that I found. For example, uh, the first group have a high percentage of the revenue that come from quattro pelagic species. Some of them travel further, have bigger distance that they travel. Uh, okay. And, and the key of this is okay, now I have this group, and now I can put this result in a landing model. Uh, in this case, I'm estimating a multi level Bayesian model. The multi level allows you then to have coefficients by different clusters. Okay. So I use the package uh, VR, VRMS. Which is a package that actually uses uh, the code from a stand, which is uh, known for Bayesian estimation, uh, but in, a, in the R framework, uh, in R Studio. Okay. Uh, and if you see this the, the, in the right side, uh, this code I have here, uh, you have to write the whole equation, like the, the landing model, what you're going to estimate. And at the end, uh, I can include for where I'm going to find this kind of different coefficient for each variable. So in this case, I choose like, oh, by port and cluster, okay? So then you run this model and the nice thing, and then you get this kind of figure I have in the right corner in the top uh, that they, I found different. For example, this is for the effect of a closer in, in the feature. I found it unit depending on the cluster I found before with this cluster package when I run my multi-level Bayesian model, okay? So that is the whole project I'm doing. Uh, we have the paper done soon. Thank you very much. Thanks, Felipe. All right, next up we have Desiree Tomasi. Go ahead, Desiree. Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. So I'm a fishery scientist at the Southwest Science Center in La Jolla. I'm also affiliated with the University of California, Santa Cruz. 
And uh, over the past few months, I've been working on developing a Pacific a management strategy evaluation for Pacific bluefin tuna. And uh, Pacific bluefin tuna being a highly migratory species, it's managed uh, internationally. And uh, there's also a science agency that provides science for the managers that is, is international, and that is the ISC. I put their logo here. And so in developing the management strategy evaluation, I've been working closely with the ISC, Pacific Bluefin Tuna Working Group. And so it was important for us to have a repository for all the code so that it could be shared with everybody in that group for testing and, uh, and then contributions, of course, to that code. So the workflow needed to be fully reproducible so that everybody could, could test it as it's being developed. And, uh, and also we needed to work uh, with stock synthesis as well as sort of a coding um, app that was, uh, that was familiar with everybody. And in fisheries, that, that tends to be R. And so we have uh, in an MSC, you have one model that tells you what the simulated true dynamics of the population of interest, in this case, bluefin, and the fisheries that acting on it uh, are doing. So that model is similar to stock uh, the uh, stock assessment model for bluefin, and that's written in stock synthesis. And you're going to have different simulated true dynamic depending on different assumptions that you're making about some of the parameters. And, and so our R code generates data from that simulated truth and that is fed in the management procedure. And that procedure can or cannot have a stock synthesis assessment model. It's gonna have a harvest control rule and that's, that's an overall tack. And then that is a split amongst the different fleets uh, using a specific allocation. And then that catch is fed back into the into the operating model or this uh, your true population with or without an implementation error and you can run this closed loop many times and uh, and you're also the code also takes out performance metrics so the aim of an msc is really to compare different harvest control rules and uh, you need to uh, assess their performance based on a set of management objectives that the stakeholders have provided. And uh, you make those quantitative using performance metrics. And, uh, and we also have plots and tables that are produced within the code. Thank you. That's very... All right, next up we have Brian Smith. Um, and let me get your slide set up, Brian. Do you want me? Okay, it looks like the video is playing. Are yeah, playing? that looks great. Thank you, Catherine. Okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Smith. I'm located at the Northeast Fishery Science Center in Woods Hole. And what I have to share today will focus on fish guts, uh, predator prey interactions, fish feeding ecology, etc., for the Northeast US continental shelf, and how the software R and tools such as the package Shiny and R Markdown have made um, our work uh, much, much easier to do. So if you're not familiar with these tools, uh, a few folks have already mentioned them. Um, you ought to check them out for yourselves. But with R Markdown, uh, this is a useful tool for producing documents and uh, sharing results from R. So think of it as a backbone, or what I like to think of it as uh, a binding, sort of a binding for a book with sharing a product. And with Shiny, this allows the product uh, to become interactive. So the product responds to user inputs. So it doesn't really need to be said, but uh, common to the federal fisheries arena, there are tons of data available. So in terms of fish feeding ecology, the Northeast has the largest continuous fish diet database in the world. So you've heard the saying, no guts, no glory. Well, we say the same thing, but with more of a literal meaning to it. So in our case, we have close to 200 predators available, uh, thousands of unique prey taxa, uh, 50 years of data, and this is going strong. So it equals about a million or so unique records uh, or more, depending on how you look at the data. So what we regularly do with these data include <clears throat> quantifying fish trophic interactions as a form of natural mortality for use in fish stock assessments. Uh, we like to examine feeding relationships with environmental conditions and look at feeding behavior relative to interactions with uh, human activities. So our foundational questions are what prey and how much of these prey are eaten by the fish community for an entire continental shelf. 
So where do you start with this hairball information? And that's depicted on the left, sort of lower left of the, of the slide. With a little bit of help from R, we've created an application to provide an introduction, uh, metadata or data about data, analyses and statistics for interested users to answer some of these major questions. As a result of this application, uh, my team's efficiency has been increased in terms of data sharing and sharing programmatic information. I see this application as a living document, which complements and expands previous tech memos and research reports, which were tomes of information, um, upwards of over 600 pages a piece. But now this product can remain 100% current and with annual updates, uh, it does not require as much sifting through of pages uh, by the user to get to information. So we all know that data in any form can be visually enhanced to share a story. And this application maximizes this visualization uh, being in silico and interactive in real time. And last but not least, an important part of this application is that is it is easily accessible uh, pretty much by anybody in the world. So uh, this is important for, for a useful tool to have. So when you get a chance, uh, please check it out. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. All right, and then I believe this is our last speaker, Catherine Foley. Go ahead, Catherine. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for sticking around until the end. Um, Today, I'm gonna to be talking a little bit about the operational tools that we use uh, for the Northeast Fishery Science Center bottom trawl survey. Um, here in the bottom trawl group, we have several ongoing projects that are really focused on increasing efficiency, transparency, reproducibility, and flexibility. Um, this we found is really imp important, particularly in light of uh, increasing wind development on the East Coast. So that ability to be very open about what we're doing and also have the flexibility to change at a moment's notice is very, very important to us. Um, one example of this that I'm going to, to talk about today is uh, our survey station creation. And um, this is a process we go through before uh, our spring and our fall surveys, where historically we've had an app that was developed by our um, information technology division and uh, Dave Chevrier, where uh, he was actually, he built a, an ArcGIS model builder model um, to randomly select stations for us. Um, and the front end of that was actually produced in Microsoft Silverlight. However, uh, Microsoft Silverlight is no longer supported, which caused a bit of a problem for us when we realized that. Um, but with some quick work, we actually developed, we exported the Python code behind that, that script, uh, and we developed an R wrapper for that Python script um, so that we could actually still run the, the product. Um, over time, we realized that it would be great if we're actually able to uh, create a more modular version that's much more flexible. So as we uh, might encounter changes to our survey design, the script can actually uh, adapt with us. So we've been working on this over the last year or so. Um, we're currently uh, putting it into a Shiny user interface, uh, and we're adding all of the output files that we need in order to uh, implement our survey and run it uh, with all of our pre-season planning tools. Uh, so currently, um, we have our, our script to produce these, these stations. Uh, it's run through R and R Shiny. And it actually outputs all of the files that we need um, for all of our planning, including our Fiscus Ready stations, so all of the, the station information that goes into our database, as well as navigation files for all of the white boats, uh, charts for all of the chief scientists, as well as reports. Uh, so it's producing reports for the State Department, uh, the National Marine Sanctuary, and also reports on wind development areas and where we might encounter uh, interaction with wind development areas. So this is currently where we, we stand with this project. Uh, in addition to this, we also have projects looking at uh, survey report automation, where uh, we have our projects that are looking at gear maintenance tracking and how to track what gear we're using and how long it's been maintained. Uh, and this is just an ongoing process that we're, we're undergoing in the, the bottom trail survey in the Northeast. Thank you. Thanks, Catherine. So yeah, that's all of our presenters today. Um, and with that, I'll pass this back to Katie. Um, I think we have time for some questions. Thank you so much, Catherine. Yes, we do. We have about 10 minutes left in this presentation or uh, closer to nine now. But if you do have a question, please place that in the question panel. 
and we will be happy to read that out loud and get answers from our presenters. Giving everybody 30 seconds to answer <laughs> or type something down quickly. <laughs> Uh, I, I will ask if any of our speakers have questions for each other. Okay, we did have one question uh, to Brian Smith. How did you create the food web in your app? Uh, it's a, I'd have to look it up. It's a fairly easy to use package in R, um, but I, <laughs> I could look it up now, but just give me a few minutes. <laughs> but it's, no it's all in, yeah, It's all in R. Let me, let me see if I can find it. <laughs> okay. Well, Brian is looking that up. Uh, we do have a question. Uh, the R package with C++, the RCPP, uh, does it include OpenMP? Hoping someone will self-identify for that uh, C++ R package. I believe that's Andrea talking about the FIPS yeah. package. And no, we do not include, what was it, the MCP? OpenMP. Open um, we currently don't um, have OpenMP incorporated into the FIMS package. Okay, no. Um, we don't have a question, but someone wanted to compliment all of you and say that this was super smooth and they're a huge fan of the Lightning Talk format. So A plus for everyone. I'm going to circle back to Brian to see if he has uh, discovered the answer. Yep. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, the couple couple packages. Uh, it's like Shiny JS, <clears throat> Viz Network, uh, Geo. GeoMet and iGraph. So those those four looks like I used <laughs> in my in my code. Great, we might have to get that uh, popped into the chat. Sure, I could do that. Um, I had a question for the other presenters. Um, for those of you who presented um, like data data that you deliver. Uh, particularly with GitHub packages, how how or do you track use of that? And I, I'm sort of I think about this a lot. Am I am I getting the information out to the folks who need it? So anyone who wants to reflect on that. I'll make a comment that um, our package is pretty new, the stock smart package. Um, and currently, I just think it's people within our branch using it. There's no reason it can't be used by anybody in any part of the country because all of the federal stocks are included. How we would track that, um, I don't know, other than looking at your insights, but you don't actually get to see who these people are, right? It's just how many people have, have stopped by. So I don't know. It's not like the old Google Analytics where you could actually get a lot more information. I don't know how to, I don't know how to do that. So a follow up on that, Andy, do you have any way for people who use that data to cite it? Like, do you use DOIs or do you have some other mechanism? So we're still working that out. I, most of so there's an official stock smart website citation. I have created a, a citation for the R package, but I haven't run it past anybody yet or um, got got the seal of approval. So I need to go through those that process first, I think. But eventually, I'd like the package to be citable. Okay, we do have a question for Alana and Rory. Um, is the Shiny that you mentioned up and running? And if it is, is there a link for that? 
Um, uh, the Shiny, our Shiny app is not quite currently up and running because there's some data privacy issues. So our repo is currently private. Um, I imagine after the completion of our project, our goal is to kind of hand it off to NOAA personnel and then they're going to rebrand it a little bit and, um, and then it would probably be up. Um, I think we both plan on making demo versions of our apps on our repositories without um, the data that has the privacy issues, though, if you want to stand by and check those out in the near future. Thank you all, and thank you again to our speakers and the NIMS R user group.